Welcome to Ruins and Haunting Heritage. My name is Dr. April Besaw. I'm an Associate Professor of Anthropology at Vassar College, and this is my archaeology seminar for the fall 2020 semester. I'm going to cover Lisa Hill's article, Archaeologies and Geographies of the Post-Industrial Past, Landscape, Memory, and the Spectral. And this introduces the concept of specters and how that intersects with ghosts and spirits and haunted places within the concept of the walking tour, that you could traverse a landscape and experience almost a time slip using Roger Clark's uh, taxonomies of ghosts, but a time slip that isn't all encompassing that is kind of as you go through each place within that walking towards landscape you will experience some other thoughts of senses of understandings of a past that is both tangible and intangible at the same time so lisa hill starts on page 380 saying that as both cultural geographer and contemporary archaeologist I am particularly interested in the manner in which the past influences and interrupts the present. Those barely perceptible echoes from the past have the power to move us in unexpected ways. In other words, I want to examine not just the legacy of the past, but its capacity to generate effective registers to evoke and to unsettle. So this permeation of the past into the present is something that we've talked about throughout this course. And that the reason that we do this is because it's important to see how that can impact people who are from the landscape, but also people who encounter that landscape. Still on page 380, what is often the archaeological work on memory is not the act of remembering, but a representation of memory, the inscription of memory on space, an artifact. A gravestone. So each of these things, the artifact, the gravestone, the ruin, she sees as a memory. And that how do we trigger that memory? How do we connect to that memory? And one of the ways to do it is by, as she does, walking the landscape with somebody else who has memories of that landscape and asking them to speak of those memories. And if you do this over and over again with different people, you could create all of the stories of that landscape and kind of formalize the social memory of that place. So when we do our walking ghost tours of the Vassar College campus, generally in between the stories that I tell at each stop, people tell each other their own stories of the places that we've been, the places that we're going. And those stories were there in their, these people's lives and experiences, but they get triggered when they get put into a space where somebody is asking, you know, do you have a story of this place? So this idea of a walking tour being a way of pulling these memories together. On page 381, uh, Lisa uses archaeologist Andy, Hill, Andy Jones um, to say that because mere material culture endures while people change, Objects have the power to affect us as a kind of material echo from the past, but we should look at absence, which is where haunting comes in. So whereas the gravestone can help you remember a person or an event or a place, the broken gravestone next to it, that, that's a little more haunting than the one that is easily readable. And I would say that that's where archaeology can step in to help return some of that haunted memory by unhaunting it, by finding some of the stories that are there, but that in the way that we tell it, we might keep the haunting as part of it. And that way make the story uncanny and interesting and leave the materiality the way it is, but kind of be almost a medium between the person who remembers, the person who doesn't remember, and the person 
who is looking at it, who is seeking that uh, recollection. So she defines spectrality as the manner in which spaces can disrupt our ideas of presence and absence. So this suggests that our experience of the world is haunted by a space-time in which the past and future coexist and interact in uncertain and unpredictable ways. Understood in these terms, the spectral is not a ghostly spirit hovering over a concrete world of real objects and living bodies, but is integral to our experience of the world. Right? I think that's a very important quote there, um, that it's not that ghosts in a, the spectral, right, using her definition of spectral, that it's not necessarily a ghost that is separate from a real world, but that it is that there are these ghostly aspects of our real world that are part of how we experience our world on a regular basis. Still on page 381, she says, the spectral unsettles any linear understanding of time, disturbing our sense of place and self through the arrival of haunting memories. And those might be welcome displacements or they might be unwelcome. On page 382, she says, before knowing whether one can differentiate between the specter of the past and the specter of the future, the past present and the future present, one must ask oneself whether the spectrality effect does not consist in undoing this opposition. So if we get too obsessed about whether the specter is of the past or of the future, we might miss the fact that the specter reminds us that there is no past or no future that are separate from each other, that it's all kind of a circle, and that the specter is outside of time because time itself is a social construct. So for those in the have been going through the entire 13 weeks of the course, way back in the beginning of the course, um, we talked about Harrison Chippewa's critique of binaries in their uh, book on archaeological theories and that there's too much falsehood in binaries. Things aren't black or white. There's a lot of gray in things. So this sense that archaeologists deal with presence and absence needs to consider the fact that that itself is a dichotomy and some things are partially present and partially absent back to that gravestone I was talking about earlier that might be broken off and therefore a lot of it is missing, but some of it is still there. So when we see ghosts, that, pr that proves that binaries are themselves a falsehood. On page 382, she says, the challenge in all this work is to construct a narrative of the past that attends to the discursive and embodied conditions of its existence in the present, to highlight the matter that brings forth memories, and to make visible the invisibility of the spectral. Right? So that makes a lot of the challenge of the work outlined for you in a way that makes it clear why it's so challenging and why sometimes archaeology takes a long time. So Hill's paper aspires to create a narrative style that allows other voices to be heard, not just the authors, a style that remains sensitive to the ways in which individuals experience memory as multi-sensual and spatial ways of understanding their worlds as embodied acts of remembering. It is rather about making meaningful statements of the past in the context of the present. It is also about revealing something of the matter in which the past erupts into the present and the future present can be found in the past. So being able to allow on, say, my walking ghost tour of the Vassar campus, other people to say, hey, but that place is haunted, or I have a story, or wow, do you smell that? That is a way of creating an archeology span or an experience of a landscape where the spectral is allowed, that it's not just the binary of who's in charge and who's listening, who's the speaker, um, the places that we have to go versus the places we might go, right? So any place on a walking tour can be a stop if you allow it to be versus saying, well, that's not a stop. 
right? So this spectrality allows us to think about the in-between spaces as being possibly not in-between spaces to somebody else. So she uses um, a case study of a, a walk in England that includes um, the remnants of an iron and coal mine, of a tramway, of a church, of a railway line. And throughout the process, she and the person that she is experiencing this landscape with imagine the smells and sounds that would have been there in the past. This multi-sensorial um, aspect of the past, of the landscape, that you know, it's really not going on a past landscape if it doesn't sound the same, if it doesn't smell the same, especially in an industrial landscape that would have large noises and, and very strong odors like an iron and coal mine with a railway there, right? You can't, you need the entire sensory experience in order to have your attempt at a time slip. Um, so this is something that's talked about a lot in um, Michael Shanks and Mike Pearson's book, Theater Archaeology, that I mentioned in another uh, lecture. So we have to think about the ability to linger on the landscape and think of things like why places are named the way they are and whether they were named something different in the past. Think of how certain things conjure stories of one person's experiences or another. Um, and that how people of different ages might have experienced that same landscape very differently. So if you're a child living near a coal mine versus you're a coal miner, it's the same landscape, but the memories are going to be different. So she says that we need to uh, think about evocative description, that even if we can't create the noises and the sounds and the recreate the experiences of past peoples, we should be able to describe things in ways that evoke an understanding. For example, she points to a very large heap of soil and speaks of how long it must have taken to create that heap of soil. On page 389, she says the forest, which is something that has been an interesting part of our exploration of haunting heritage in that uh, the forest is usually only um, peopled by ghosts that are more of a animal sense or more of a primal nature sense than of a uh, more human ghostly sense. Um, she says the forest certainly has the power to confuse, rendering the familiar unfamiliar or uncanny. The power of the uncanny arrives not, at, not by our encounter with anything strikingly odd or unknown, rather it is held with something that has a familiarity about it. The uncanny arises from instances, including incidents, where one becomes lost and has to accidentally retrace one's, one's footsteps. So allowing people to go into places in your tour that is familiar to them, but might be a place where they have to get lost or they will get lost, is a way of bringing that uncanny out and might make it more of a visceral experience or more understandable, or it might be alienated, right? That there's again that edge of the uncanny. On page 391, she says, the act of walking creates powerful recollections because it provokes a distinct and familiar tactility with the world. Repetition is crucial to the reproduction and evocation of memory. The repetition of stories told, the objects used, and the paths walked. However, repetition is not solely about presence. It has a strong bearing on absence too, ushering in the haunting apparition of the specter. So I think one of the reasons that ghost tours of college campuses is, is very effective in getting people to think about the past of their community is because they've done that same walk, right? Maybe not in the same order, but they've walked those same places over and over again, and they've never noticed these things. They've never noticed these places. They've never noticed the detail on that building. And that evokes both memory of themselves and memory of others who are going to do that in the future, right? Memories of the future that breaks down that binary 
um, of the past and the present and the future. Um, on page 391 still, she uses Connerton, who we talked about in the lecture, um, How Societies Remember. Um, using, quoting Connerton, um, she says, we come to know each other by asking for accounts, by giving accounts, by believing or disbelieving stories about each other's pasts and identities. So I think that's another reason that ghost hunting on TV creates such a following is that when people tell stories about what they've experienced and what they've felt, you feel connected to those people. You feel like they're your friends and you start to care about them and you want to hear more of their stories. So I think we could do the same thing through walking tours where people are put in these experiences of these familiar places that become an unfamiliar through new stories being told about them but also that being hearing those stories, we start to care for each other and care for the people that were in the past of our place and even care for the people who are going to be in the future of our place. On page 392, she says, the fright of ghostly memories disorients place and self. It confounds, bewilders and startles. Haunting memories of the dead drag us into other places and time. They beckon us from the past. These specters haunt us, they move and disturb us, they are always there. Specters, even if they do not exist, even if they are no longer, even if they are not yet. Right? So there's this power in this bewilderment, in this disorientation, right? that we need to think about how that can be read by different people in different ways and impact them differently. So the narrative style that Hill advocates is that of a literary montage that uses, uh, she says, juxtaposition and discontinuity and small diversions that border on the surreal to create a reverberation from the past. Um, so, but you still have to remain faithful to the stories of the places that are on the walk and to the landscape and to our conversations. So you don't necessarily need to create linearity in a walking tour of a landscape in that this happened first and then that happened. It doesn't have to be a rigid story uh, that has themes at each stop. That having this montage of juxtaposition and discontinuity, allowing things to not necessarily make sense or relate to each other, um, that is what creates the reverberation from the past that might make it that it creates spaces for everybody's voices and experiences to be heard and senses to be tingled and therefore might make that tour even more interesting.